so much for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Nolan Rampey. Uh, I'm a clinician at Howard Center um, and involved with the union. I also a uh, longtime activist here in Burlington and a member of uh, Tempest Collective, which is a socialist organization. Um, so yeah, thank you again for coming out tonight. We've got a great panel of speakers that's going to be focused on uh, police accountability, uh, states, uh, you know, police accountability, and how we can address that through a myriad of different ways. So we've got speakers that are going to give general overview of you know what's happened since the Black Lives Matter and the defund the police movement, as well as uh, speaker with the Free Per movement. I'll give some more uh, individualized introductions. Um, for each individual speaker, um, and then along with the police accountability and a Howard Center, a Howard Center president who's going to be talking about some of the social services. So there's going to be a lot to discuss after the speakers. There will be a chance for an open discussion where people can ask questions, uh, give comments. So hopefully that can all be really productive. Um, all right. So our first speaker is going to be Paul Fleckenstein, who will kind of be giving that overview of what things have looked like since the defund the police movement and where we're at right now. Um, Paul is a longtime activist here in Burlington. He was actually involved in getting um, a police station uh, shut down or, or uh, not being built correct back, in, easier, yeah. Yeah, back <laughs> in the 90s, um, which is great. He's also a member of, of the Tempest Collective. So uh, please welcome Paul. Prosecutions, 
new laws primarily pushed by Republicans against protests and defunding and defending vigilante violence spearheaded um, by automobile drivers who are funding or freed of liability for running into protesters. There was also co-optation. The co-optation occurred through redirecting the movement into elections in the Democratic Party. And you all can remember former President Obama's intervention with LeBron James to head off the NBA basketball players joining the protest movement in a strike um, and instead part of out the vote for the elections in November of 2020. There were also political and organizational weaknesses across the broad left, like DSA, um, failed, failed terribly to relate to the uprising effectively, um, and this hindered the capacity of the movement. Subsequently, police reform laws passed, basically amounting to more money, technology, and training for policing. <coughs> Virtually everywhere there were small cuts to police budgets, these have been reversed. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk sp specifically about, about Burlington later on, because I think that has its own uh, unique character here. That's important to take up. There's been no change in police killings, one every eight hours, with a record number in 2022, so 12,000. Sorry, 1,200. Demographically, almost all working class. Whites are the largest group, and blacks and Hispanics. Police kill African Americans disproportionately three times the rate of whites. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Underneath this, there are tens of thousands of injuries, traumatic brain injury, trauma, brutality, torture. Um, so, I think the tip of the iceberg metaphor is good here. Great. Um, and the backlash continues. The Democrats have doubled down on law and order. The Biden administration uses every opportunity to promote more cops and spending on policing. Vermont Governor Scott used his inaugural address this month to chastise critics of violent and racially biased policing as endangering public safety. And he's got a bipartisan ovation in the State House. The New York Times ran a heartless propaganda article on Burlington's supposed anti-police problem and an ensuing raft of petty crime. And Burlington Mayor Weinberger claims Democratic oversight of police is a step too far. <laughs> the dissipation of the Black Lives Matter protests, but not only these, has also meant that the far-right street presence has little opposition. From white nationalist vigilantes against Black Lives Matter this movement has also demonstrated against teaching about racism in schools, against LGBTQ rights, against reproductive rights, and generally for white nationalism, all to uphold traditional gender, racist, and, capitalist, and a capitalist social order. In some countries, this has even taken a form looking like fossil fascism, a reactionary fight to protect fossil fuel production and traditional values. Criminalization has been the favorite response of U.S. rulers to the trauma, poverty, and social instability generated by capitalism. The state and capital have carried out 50 years of neoliberal cuts to social safety nets and advanced deregulation, tax cuts, and other policies to spur wealth accumulation at the top and inequality for the rest of us. In the U.S., this has been a bipartisan effort. A basic goal has been to restore and maintain profit rates in response to crises of profitability. Internationally, as well, ramping up the carceral state, levering around racial oppression, curbing union and democratic rights, has been the protection against shredding working class living standards and futures. And this is one reason the George Floyd uprising was international in scope. Tax rates in the U.S. and federal funding for cities have been cut dramatically since the 1970s. There is much less money for housing, culture, recreation, welfare, education, urban development, health care, children, and public sector union jobs. The relative budgets for policing have increased, though. Federal subsidies for prison construction have been enormous. The state will use illegality and violence when necessary to enforce oppressive social, to enforce an oppressive social order. This can be explicitly directed against working class power. For instance, Congress's recent suppression of the railroad workers' strike last year, and remember, it would have been cops who broke the picket lines mm -hmm. for this strike. And less directly, 
but no less violently in a broad sense. The Federal Reserve is raising interest rates intentionally to cause a recession and intentionally to increase unemployment in order to break the power of workers to raise their wages and to resist oppressive working conditions. So I think these are kind of broad out outlines and some markers of the system and dynamics that we're up against. And I want to talk kind of finally to finish up about the moment we're in now. We face multiple and interacting crises. Some commentators call this the poly crisis, social, economic, and ecological. The ruling class is banking on repression to protect the status quo distribution of power and wealth. The poly crisis can and is currently producing huge suffering, and importantly for us to come to terms with, also pessimism and despair for the future, according to polls. But it also provides a foundation for broader mass struggle. Um, think of Iran in, in the fall. Think of Black Lives Matter, I think, was part of this. And more advanced political conclusions in building the left and about the nature of the problem. Capitalism and the alternative, abolition and socialism. A big lesson of 2020 is that mass movements and protests are essential for our side to win things. We need more struggle, less focus on elections, and it's key to build organizations to fight however modest we start. We need to think about, we need to think hard and experiment on how to engage broader working class forces. And finally, we need to prioritize anti-racist politics rooted in workplaces and communities that is committed to political independence from the Democrats, aiming to be able to disrupt normal operations of things, and with a radical horizon toward a multi-class, a multi-racial class struggle challenging uh, the status quo and toward uh, a different kind of world. Jaina Ossoff. She is the uh, she's a prison abolition organizer uh, with the Free Her movement, and is also uh, this is working under the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Please welcome Jaina. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So we also know that prisons don't work. Recidivism rates in Vermont hover around 52.5%, but I have a feeling it's actually much higher than that. And they're so high because people are released and they don't have the supports they need. So we believe funding should go to the community because prisons really serve as a revolving door that does nothing but cause further trauma and harm. So also many community groups that are doing alternative work or reentry work in between actually have to receive their funding from the Department of Corrections because there's not enough allocated in our general budget for those services. Um, I'm also on the Vermont Bail Fund and we could bail out essentially half of CRCF if we have the money. And also so many are being held pre-trial are there due to technical violations like losing housing, losing a job, being late for an appointment. Like we don't believe people should be in prison but that especially is not a reason to be in prison. Um, so what we know is there's only around like 20 folks that really need long-term support and care. And we think that can be done in a facility that doesn't have to look like or be a prison. Mm -hmm. So also, um, so what we know is, it's, okay, so just to frame this, it's important, I think, for people to be on the same page about what we mean about abolition, because these terms have very large and different connotations, depending on your exposure to these ideas. Um, I don't think I'll be able to adequately describe all the elements in abolition in this time frame, but I'll definitely focus on some of the most important. Um, I would say the central idea of abolition is that we do not believe these systems can be reformed. We believe prisons and policings, police systems were designed to do exactly what they're doing today, which is to oppress and control us. So returning to the quote by Ruth Wilson Gilmore, if you caught it on slide one, Abolition is the absence of prisons and the presence of life-affirming institutions. We don't believe in just opening the doors to prisons and letting everyone run free without a plan or support. Most of us believe in creating community-based care settings that provide wraparound services that actually engage people in healing and rehabilitation. We really want to create the conditions in society that would make prisons obsolete to begin with and um, we believe in providing society with the skills they need to navigate conflict and harm independent of state intervention. And we also believe in making sure everyone's needs are met. So a tough part in this abolitionist argument is that we do understand that some folks are going to need to be incapacitated, for lack of a better word, and will have to be taken care of in a setting that might be removed from the community for a while, but that setting will always preserve human dignity and prioritize holistic healing. Okay. So also to ground you more in what we're doing, some of our goals is that we really strive to create a community-centered world rooted in love in which we fund or we shift funding to like housing, healing, treatment, the things Paul was talking about that make us successful communities. And along the way, we really need to redefine harm in the ways we address it. Not all harm is addressed in our current system. If you look at the biggest polluters of this planet, their actions are not necessarily deemed illegal, yet they are harming people in the environment on such a massive scale. We also believe in integrating approaches to healing, addressing healing without having violence in there. And we also want to provide folks with what they need to not only survive but thrive and really start interrupting those cycles of violence and trauma. Um, but yes, abolition encompasses so much more, but these are the main components. And I urge folks to agree we do this till we free us by Miriam Kaba. Um, so taking these principles and applying it to our own community, 95% of folks in CRCS, the women's prison in Vermont, have experienced violence. To me, we can clearly see there was a social failure there and that folks recovering from trauma are not receiving the supports they need and it's leading them to get entangled in our systems. I believe that prisons do not allow us to address the underlying social problems that are leading people to incarceration and it's actually just a lazy band-aid solution. And we believe that decision makers have been experimenting with prisons for centuries 
and it's our turn to try our methods. Um, we know that this is possible to looking at why they were able to end youth incarceration last year. And they were able to do this by moving from a punitive to an indigenous programming system. They established a campus that, quote, engages youth in activities that give back to the community. They distribute food in their neighborhoods. They work with the local elementary schools. They plan time to hang out with family and friends. And in this, they become people who contribute, care for, and belong to the community. So we see that these coalition partners that make this campus were able to end incarceration through integrating indigenous cultural practices. And they were saying that for many indigenous Hawaiian youth there, the only way to counter over a century of colonization and its systems was to reconnect with their ancestors. So looking at the work on a local level, um, we are Free Her Vermont. There's like five of us here. Um, we launched in the fall of 2020, and this is what our work currently encompasses. So right now we are introducing some policy, a prison moratorium bill, which will halt prison construction for five years. Also, I'm not sure if folks are aware, but there is a school construction moratorium in Vermont that activists have been trying to lift. So we will be adding a lift of that moratorium, and our moratorium, and we'll also be pushing an elder parole bill and working to a <coughs> program here because that is just a revolving door also. So we just want to work on expanding pathways out of prison. Um, also, the basic income guarantee is the first step in our reimagining communities program for the state. We also do legal work. Um, we're not doing it formally yet, but we will be formally launching our hub in this year. And that allows us to help community mem members with their legal cases and support them through that traumatic process. And as always, our work will continue to be shifting the narrative. Many people, thank you, have not had conversations like this yet, and we think it's a really important step that's necessary to changing these mainstream ideas about prisons, incarcer incarceration, and harm. So this is just our fourth month of the campaign now, and we'll constantly be building and evolving, so please stay in touch. And just a big thank you from Free Here Vermont that you all were here and receptive to this, and we really hope to see you at something coming up. Thank you. All right, next up is going to be Andy Blanchett. Um, Andy is a worker at Howard Center and actually was just recently elected as the president of AFSCME 1674, which is the union. And no one's being bashful. He's our vice president. <laughs>
This is why unionized social service agencies are of the utmost importance. Workers must be able to collectively bargain for wages that we know will retain our coworkers and provide quality services to our community members. The importance of continuity of services. So uh, community members across Howard Center rely on having people who know them to work with them and know what they need and what they, what they want. Um, when there is constant turnover, the quality of support inevitably diminishes and community members do not receive the supports that they need. At best, this delays growth or attainment of goals. At worst, this can put community members receiving services in danger or seriously isolate them from the rest of the community, which causes them great harm. This is true across all services. The impact of burnout. When people receiving services are not having their support implemented as needed, other workers have to pick up extra work, meaning there is too much to do for too, too many people. When this occurs, many uh, when this occurs, workers will burn out, and this will lead to, to workers leaving. Mm -hmm. This only worsens the cycle. Not only that, this burned out worker can then impact their community's attitude towards the people who need social services. <laughs> uh, clients who are frustrated at how their needs are not being met may then communicate that verbally and physically to those around them while in the community or at school or in a residential setting. Some clients may end up dealing with the carceral system rather than getting the right amount of support they need in the first place, often leading to the behavior already. The impact of capitalism in class. Meanwhile, social workers see the police continue to get increased funding and see plans for a new prison to be created out of the manufactured fear in the community regarding crime. It is a slap in the face, and we are all, uh, all the while told, explicitly or implicitly, that the reward for the work that we do won't come from money, and that's just how things are. <laughs> More social workers are seeing this for what it is. It's a way to divide workers. Still, some of us, experiencing understaffing in acute crises, find ourselves in situations where we're in danger and see the role of police as essential since there are no other solutions currently available. The current structure of social work, when designed by the ruling class to fail, can easily divide workers and have us support that which goes against ourself and collective interests. The state has shown again and again for decades that it would rather create the appearance of safety and rehabilitation for the white liberal than actually divest from the root causes of crime and harm, which is capitalism. Mm -hmm. With no sign of divestment from capitalism in sight, social services are then put into this gray area. Since these root causes will fundamentally change, um, lost my place, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so since those root causes won't fundamentally change, social services are viewed as the answer. Um, social services are then purposefully underfunded and deemed ineffective. The predetermined answer to that becomes to fund the punitive measures which further harms the working class, and the cycle continues. The role of labor. Without strong unions and organizing, the current structures, structures of designated agencies do not allow for workers' input regarding what people receiving services may need and what workers must have to meet those needs. Mm -hmm. To be clear, the voices of those who receive services are often the most stifled in discussions. Mm -hmm. Designated agencies in Vermont are often led by wealthy white people, the same people who buy into the illusion of safety and rehabilitation provided by the personal system. Right. Workers will need to um, will need to push designated agencies away from alignment with said, said systems through collective organizing. Workers with organizing power allow working class people to both have impact and influence over their working conditions locally and have a say within the legislature. When workers experience a housing crisis, particularly for renters at this point, this directly impacts our ability to stay at our jobs, advocate for ourselves, our clients, and our fellow workers, in addition to our collective ability to advocate within the legislature. 
Workers in social services are beginning to wake up and see, in large part due to this housing crisis, how we are all a half step away from needing the same supports and services our clients need. Yep. For example, if we lose our apartments and are couch surfing, we may need to defend ourselves in the same way our clients may need to. If we are to defend ourselves while being without a home in a vulnerable situation, we too could end up losing our jobs and be thrust into the carceral system. The, the prison industrial complex is a tool by the working class to harm working class people the most and we know that it has been specifically created to target black and brown workers en masse. Labor then must take up the call and work in coalition with fellow working class groups that have been advocating for the abolishment of prisons and police since long before the collective uprisings of 2022. Um, some considerations for this panel. It may be helpful trying to get Green Mountain self-advocates and or other self-advocacy groups into this discussion. It was not long ago that the Brandon Training School existed in the state, and though people with disabilities and mental health challenges are often stereotyped as dangerous, these demographics of folks are statistically the most likely groups to experience harm by the hands of people in their communities. This is without accounting for the intersections of race and gender. Self-advocates are our neighbors, our coworkers, and they need to be part of this conversation. Um, and when I come to the work in Burlington, 
I think about creating the conditions for people to thrive. And unfortunately, community control of police is not a service. It does not provide alternatives to policing. It acknowledges that policing exists in our city. And in our current political climate, our city is not ready to move beyond policing. And in those conditions, we are fighting for an accountability system for the police to have to operate within, which is, of course, just like all the other things that, we, that the other panelists talked about, an affront to our system as it is. Mm -hmm. And so the backlash is very understandable. But my hope is that for folks who are here and who listen to this, that there's an understanding of what this ballot uh, measure is talking about, that there's clarity about what it has the ability to do and what it doesn't have the ability to do. It is not a defund measure, for example. Um, it is not chasing police officers out of town. <laughs> it is not reducing the number of officers on the force. However, when this came about, there were other asks on the table specific to Burlington. And um, of course, our words will always be twisted. Um, just really quickly, how familiar are folks with community control of police, the, the charter change ballot proposal? Okay, so I'm not gonna like test you on the five main principles, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that that can help to move things along um, a little bit in what I'm sharing. Um, so, I'm a part of People for Police Accountability, and has morphed with a lot of other <laughs> groups of people. Um, essentially, no, I would say anyone who is concerned, who is a concerned resident, and um, and is willing to organize around community control of police, is a part of People for Police Accountability. Um, but essentially, I just want to orient us. We are talking about a charter, a city charter change, and I'll talk about the full process. Um, but this proposal is a specific um, removal and substitution of language in the city charter. So it currently says that the chief of police has sole power to make disciplinary decisions that has to do with hiring, firing, um, and discipline of all kinds. Um, and, uh, and, only this, and the only case in which the city council and mayor are elected officials step in is if the chief is being investigated. And to be very clear, the police commission was created in earlier iterations of movements looking to bring accountability um, to policing in Burlington, as it did across many other cities. Um, but it has an advisory role. So um, I think it's really important to understand the five main principles, which are disciplinary power, investigatory power, independence, representation, and transparency. And these kind of five pillars were something that um, were built into the proposal through research about what has led to effective community oversight in other cities or other proposals that were on the table at the time in the fall of 2020. Um, I think I resonate a lot with what Jana said of like, our society has been uh, um, experimenting with prisons and the carceral system for many, many years, and we have very little funding and uh, length of time that we've been actually been able to implement these alternatives. Um, disciplinary power is number one. That's the most direct substitution in our current city charter. Um, that this body, the community um, uh, oversight board, would take over from the chief of police. And this wouldn't be in all cases. It would be targeted to cases of misconduct. So not dealing with an officer showing up late to work on a repeated basis, or not following other parts of kind of their handbook and their rules, but specifically around misconduct. And this might be violent <coughs> misconduct, but it also can be patterns of abuse of, pattern, uh, of power, and that is something that we are seeing live. In order to fight community control of police, the police department and the mayor collude to create a situation in which residents feel less safe yep. and where they aren't even offering the service that they're supposed to offer. Yep. Um, and, and so I just want to make sure that we're talking, because a lot of people will be like, well, there haven't been violent incidents. There have. The other, the um, investigatory power is important 
because it removes investigation from within the very body where these employees are coming from. And something I want to highlight in, in between investigatory power and independence is that currently, if you would like to report misconduct of a police officer, you have to report that to BPD. <laughs> And this body, and you know, technically they have administrators and you can like send an email and you can like do other things to create some level of distance, but this body would be able to field these, these cases of misconduct. And I believe that is the, that will allow us to have a more full narrative about the level and extent of misconduct in policing in Burlington. And I would love to see this across the state. I currently live somewhere um, that we're under the jurisdiction of the state police, and we know they also have their own their own issues. Um, independence also has to come also has a key part to play in around legal counsel for this community oversight board to have independent legal counsel where the interests are of the people and not just of the city's bottom line. Um, representation, very long very convoluted and also very important. We often find, similar to the nonprofits who are working on these social services, being led by people who are not from the working class, who are white, privileged in a number of ways. We want representation, and particularly because we're talking about policing, we've identified lived experiences and identities that are more likely to have interactions with the police. And I think, Andy, you like your whole cycle is like, I don't need to last year very long. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Because of lived experience and identities, there are people who have a more direct experience of policing. Even in my life as a light-skinned, middle-class, black person, um, I do not have direct interaction with the police on a frequent basis. And I think that's an important distinction that, I, that a lot of people don't understand is policing is a concept to some and policing is a lived experience to others. Um, and then transparency. So this is a public board and it will be subject to those um, statutes. So I know I'm running out of time um, and I don't have more slides. The last kind of couple of things that I wanted to mention is that it's great and I love talking to folks like you all. But ultimately, when we take these larger concepts of abolition, of defunding the police, of all of these kinds of reforms, um, where, where we can get in the fight is often at a local level, and it's also not where people feel the most comfortable to get in the fight. In 2020, everyone was saying, talk to your racist family member. I want to ask the people in this room to talk to the modern middle in your life. Your supervisor at work, your coworker, mm -hmm. your neighbor who you sometimes get in issues with at the condo association, <laughs> um, to the, the everyday modern middle that we, I am assuming many people in this room are progressive, that we actually swim in every day. I personally, I don't have energy to talk to our racist family members, but what I'm asking people in Burlington to do is before February 15th is when like mail-in voting happens, and March 7th is when we vote on this proposal, we have to be willing to have those conversations so we can have a more a rep representative picture about what's happening with policing in Burlington, and not just the sound bites that Moreau goes back to all the time. So, thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, just thank you again to all of our panel members. That was fantastic.